following is presented by CrewRoundTable.com Podcast Network. Did you know that half the people who live in the city of Toronto are renters? I was shocked when I found out the number was that high. With the cost of home ownership spiking over the past decade plus, one would think that maybe renting is an option and just wait until this housing bubble bursts. But renters are going through their own pressures. And at least in the city of Toronto, landlords are using some pretty devious tactics to kick some renters out and increase the rent that they can collect from new renters. And given some of the rules and regulations around renting in Toronto, those landlords might be right. Welcome to Hot Takes with Gino, an informal discussion of topics affecting those living in the greater Toronto area. For more information, visit crewroundtable.com. Welcome back, my friends, to the latest and greatest episode of Hot Takes with Gino, proudly presented by the Crew Roundtable Podcast Network. Please visit us on the web at crewroundtable.com, where you can like, subscribe, and of course, share the show with your friends and enemies. Today, we are going to be looking at the City of Toronto and the rental market in the City of Toronto as a proxy for what's happening in the rest of Ontario. We're going to be looking at two articles today, uh, both published uh, near the end of March 2017. One is called Vicious, Not So Virtuous Cycle of Rent Controls. That is by Martin Reg Cohn from the Toronto Star. And the second article is Rent Asunder, Landlords Using Evictions, Hikes to Circumvent Rent Control. That is by Jeff Gray and Tom Cardoso of the Globe and Mail. So beginning with the Globe and Mail article, uh, the Globe and Mail has an analysis of data from Ontario's Landlord and Tenant Board. So that is the chief government Uh, entity that we'll be dealing with for most of the article. Uh, This landlord and tenant board adjudicates disputes and found that a number of applications for evictions has shot up 23% since 2013. And the reason for this is because some landlords try to take advantage of the city's competitive housing market. There is a large increase in the number of tenant and landlord disputes over above guideline increases, which are allowed for rent controlled apartments after landlords do renovations or upgrades. We'll be speaking a little bit more about what exactly those renovations and upgrades are. Some of them are mandated by the city itself. Disputes over evictions for simply failing to pay the rent have declined. Now, this is a good point. Uh, because it shows that there is a healthy economy here in Ontario, in the GTA, where people are employed and they are carrying responsible debt loads as they can make their rental payments. So we're not getting into a situation where maybe some people are losing their houses and then looking for places to rent because of the because of the debt that they carry from month to month. That's actually a very good point. When dealing with the vacancy rate in Toronto, however, the vacancy rate for rental units is incredibly low. It's just at 1.6%, where almost half of the households in Toronto are renters. And as I mentioned in the intro to the show, I did not think that the amount of renters was that high, or that the vacancy rate was that low, because that means over 98% of the units available for rent are full. And that likely doesn't count the unofficial basement dwellings and single rooms that are rented all over the city and everywhere in the greater Toronto area. I know people who did just that with their homes to help pay off their homes where they would live on one floor and rent out another one. It's an excellent strategy. I tried to mimic that myself but I wasn't able to get a home that could help me fulfill that particular strategy of of, uh, getting into the housing market. But back to controlling the rents. Controlling rents is a giant issue facing Toronto and Ontario going forward. Due to the seemingly never-ending double-digit increases in the price of homes in Ontario, specifically in the GTA over the past dozen years, 
we have seen that housing market just freeze people out of being home buyers. So what is the current guideline for increasing rent? If someone is a landlord, how much rent can they increase year over year? Now the Landlord and Tenant Board is the one that sets this guideline and the Ontario guideline for rent increases for current tenants are set at 2%. So the rent increase guideline is the maximum a landlord can raise a tenant's rent without the approval of the Landlord and Tenant Board in Ontario. If a tenant moves out, however, then the landlord is free to charge the market rate to the new tenant coming in. This is of course if it is not a rent controlled building. But even if it is not a rent controlled building, if it's one of these buildings built after 1991, the amount of rent that the landlord can collect is still capped. So for long term renters, the long term renters are making out like bandits because they know that the increase in their rent is only going to be pegged to the cost of inflation. That means that they can count on having their salary increase hopefully at the cost of inflation to compensate that and they know that at least the cost of their housing is going to be commensurate with their salary. New renters coming in will be forced to pay for all of the lost rental revenue that the owner, that the landlord could have been collecting according to what they should be charging for that unit in the marketplace. So these rent controls that are coming in, they create a two-tiered system of rental units in the city of Toronto and even the ones that are not subject to rent controls have this artificial cap built in by the rate board. The cost of rent year over year is fixed to the cost of inflation. Today, the NDP, so that's the provincial Ontario NDP, has proposed a law to level the playing field. It wants to close a loophole that exempts any post-1991 apartments from rent controls, arguing that tenants in the newer rental stock are vulnerable to extortion from their landlords. The Liberal Party of Ontario they claim that they are on board with this and they are hinting at actually expanding some of the rent controls that remove that 1991 exemption and giving renters some additional powers. For instance, uh, they floated loosening some rules on landlords, such as making it easier to toss out tenants with troublesome pets. And this is in an effort to get more homeowners to rent out parts of their homes and increase that supply. Personally, that might be a drop in the bucket, but at least it shows that they're doing something, that they are trying to address the issue. How we got to this point, though, every political party in Ontario since 1970 have had a hand in bringing the current severe shortage of rental units in Ontario that we are witnessing today. In the mid-1970s, the NDP got the government of then-PC Premier Bill Davis to implement promising rent controls to stop landlords from gouging renters. When the New Democrats won power in 1990 under Bob Ray in Ontario, shocking everybody, developers abandoned the controlled rental market for the freedom of condominiums. What that means is that there has been no new development on a substantial level since the 1980s in the rental housing stock. No one built apartments as the revenue from the investment dissuaded investors. Mike Harris took power in Ontario. They made the NDP's rent controls permanent. And when the Liberals won government, they retained it as well. Uh, Gordy Dent, he is executive director for the Federation of Metro Tenants Association, according to the Globe and Mail, said that calls about landlords threatening to sell or move in and evict tenants have been rising. Remember, if you can evict the tenant, you can then charge the new tenant coming in the market rate. What we are seeing, according to Mr. Dent, is that from our call volume, landlords want to cash in on the hot rental market. And it's totally bogus. The landlords are chasing tenants away, especially long-term tenants, so that they can increase their rental revenue. In Toronto's rental condominium market, and most of these buildings are post-1991 buildings, they're not subject to rent control. Rents shot up 11.7% in the fourth quarter of 2016. 
This was over the same period from one year earlier. Now this mirrors, and it might even lag behind if you can believe it, the cost of home purchase over the same period. So the market is speaking. The question is, why should renters be exempt from the pressures of the market through rent control and caps on rent increases? I personally know of many couples that save diligently year after year. Now this is couples, people with two incomes. They save year after year, but they cannot afford a modest home that even meets some of the items on their want list. Because even though they save, the pace of the housing market actually puts them farther behind year over year. The increases in the housing market do not match and outpace their ability to save. If the cost of housing goes up 12% each year, which it has roughly, we're talking double digit increases for the past I don't know how many years here, decade plus. How many of you listening achieved an increase in your salary of 10% or more every year for the past 12 years? Go ahead. I'll wait. Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Well, I, I just I just dated myself hard way, but the point is clear. Homeowners face sharp increases. Investors face escalating cost and risk. Why should renters be left out of dealing with market realities? Now, I don't mean this as a shot against renters. And I certainly don't side with greedy landlords pulling devious moves and lying to get renters out so they can jack up the price on new renters lined up to swoop in and claim a place as the supply of rental housing is so, so short in Toronto. But I don't hear a good argument for why rent controls are necessary or achieve the goals of increasing supply of rental units to bring down the cost of renting and not in an artificial way that ignores market realities. At root, this was mentioned in the Toronto Star article, rent hikes are a result of reduced supply and increased demand, which is what puts pressure on politicians for rent controls, which then depresses supply even further. It's a vicious circle and less virtuous than one assumes. A record tight rental market that's being made even tighter as people give up on buying a home and choose to rent because of skyrocketing real estate prices. In Toronto, there is little new rental stock coming, and the existing stock has escalating costs to deal with. Uh, earlier, we mentioned some of the costs. Let's get down to some specifics. Lots of older buildings service renters. Landlords are now being forced by safety authorities to install expensive new elevators across the city. Now, new elevators are good, but it's a cost. And landlords should be entitled to recover those costs. Water and electricity bills have shot up in recent years. And the city of Toronto could be seen as discriminating against rental housing, as rental housing is taxed at three times the rate charged to condos or single-family homes, according to the Globe and Mail article. Given this climate of escalating costs on the rental side and capped revenues on the rental size, would anyone build more rental units? Or would they stick with those shiny glass condo towers that sell for market value? Well, the answer is obvious. People are not going to build rental units and they have not been building them since the 1980s, which increases the pressure on renters. So what can the government do? A government voucher. Now, that's very near and dear to the heart of people on the right uh, side of the political spectrum. They love the vouchers because it lets people vote with their wallet. And we hear this a lot, uh, but it's very expensive for the government to pull this move. They have to administer the voucher system, monitor who qualifies for the vouchers, and then play the bad guy when people no longer qualify for these vouchers. It's much easier and politically popular for governments to make landlords swallow rent increases by imposing or extending price controls, 
such as the caps on year-over-year -year rental increases. No one cares about the landlord. Every landlord is like Monsieur Thenardier in the musical version of Les Mis, a ruthless innkeeper cutting every corner until he has a round square. But with likely far less robust musical chops, or a skill with pliers to pull out gold fillings from people dead in the sewers. Why target rentals while exempting the rest of the real estate market? Noting that housing speculation is what's driving most of the current prices, or uh, sorry, driving most of the current crisis. Landlords want to see a return on their investment and charge higher rents. Renters who think that they are exempt from the housing uptick are certainly not free from its effects. Higher market prices for housing affects the rental market eventually as the cost of renting will rise to settle below, but close to, the cost of purchasing. Would any government have the stones to constrain homeowners from cashing in on rising property values? That's really the analogy we're talking about here since landlords are being constrained on their profits. The risk is not commensurate with the reward of being a landlord. And the answer to would governments constrain homeowners from cashing in on their property values is of course not. And go back and listen to the Hot Takes episode 4 to see how Markham City Council protected, in scare quotes, protected the investments of homeowners through logic twisted like a pretzel. We need a serious solution to increase the rental supply. And you do that by making it attractive to build rental units instead of another glass tower full of 400 square foot shoeboxes in the sky selling for $500,000 a pop in the city of Toronto. If you increase the supply of rental units, rents will stabilize. Landlords will still see a return on investment, and renters can live in areas they could never afford to buy in with some cost certainty. That cost certainty would be based in reality and not some arbitrary pegging of the increase in rents to the cost of inflation. It's a win-win-win for everybody involved. If not, we will get an Armageddon in housing where the rental supply continues to disappear. Landlords will play games to maximize their investment. Renters will be kicked into the street. Appeals will continue to increase. And the divide between owners and renters will continue unabated, leading to an all-out class warfare between the haves and the have-nots capital will be increasingly concentrated in the hands of a few landlords chasing record rental profit through devious means, and the many won't be able to find a place to reliably hang their hat without fear of eviction. And on that happy note, we come to the end of the latest Hot Takes with Gino. Please visit the website, crewroundtable.com, where you can subscribe to this and, of course, the flagship show, Crew Roundtable. Please rate, subscribe, share, and review the show with your friends and enemies. Take care of yourselves, everyone.